So there's these questions we all ask, big questions that have a huge effect on our lives. But there's all this information out there that makes finding a solution difficult. So we came up with a better way to give you the answers that you need. We did a survey at Easter and compiled a list of your top six most asked questions. That list then became a roadmap for this message series. Each week, we'll examine a single question and discover God's answers based on His Word. It's a series we like to call, You Asked For It. Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to see your uh, lovely faces. We are in the middle of a sermon series called You Asked For It. And as the video already indicated, back in Easter, you all took a survey and we looked to see what were some of the top things that you wanted to see covered in sermons. And uh, that is what this sermon series is about. And today in particular, we're looking at the issue of forgiveness. We're looking at forgiveness and, and particularly how to forgive people who have hurt you, how to forgive people who have hurt you. And so uh, an article on the John Hopkins medical webpage reads, whether it's a simple spat with your spouse or long-held resentment toward a family member or friend, unresolved conflict can go deeper than you may realize. It may be affecting your physical health. It goes on. Some good news. Studies have found that the act of forgiveness can reap huge rewards for your health lowering the risk of heart attack, improving cholesterol levels in sleep, reducing pain, blood pressure, levels of anxiety, depression, and stress. So you came for maybe nourishment for your soul this morning, but you're going to get nourishment for your soul and your body as a bonus for free. That's all free. So we're looking today again at how to forgive those who have hurt you, and we're going to be getting that nourishment for body and soul from the book of Colossians. Colossians is a letter in the New Testament. It's from the Apostle Paul to Christians living in the city of Colossae, hence the word Colossians. That's what their names were. And we're going to pick that up in chapter 2. And uh, you can either look at this in your Bible, at a Bible app, or you can look at it in your programs because we've provided the passage for you in your programs. Or, of course, you can just look right up here, and we'll look at it on the screen together. I've provided a little bit of context for you at the beginning and at the end, but we're going to focus mainly on verses 13 and 14. But this is where we'll pick up. For you were buried with Christ when you were baptized, and with him you were raised to new life because you trusted the mighty power of God who raised Christ from the dead. And then we're going to focus on this passage in particular. You were dead because of your sins and because your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ, for he forgave all our sins. He forgave all our sins. Moving on a little bit. He canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. In this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. And so we can make our first point of the sermon right from this passage. And it's the most important point. It's the foundational point. Everything else that follows will be built on this. So we're going to spend our most time lingering right here on this. And it is that forgiveness is founded on Christ's death for our sins. In these verses from Colossians, Paul really does start with some bad news. It's a universal problem of all human beings, that we are sinners, that we have all rebelled against the rightful king of the universe, that we are all treasonous. We're in rebellion against God. And Paul says that outside of Christ, we are all dead in our sins. And the Bible is very clear that God is a God of justice. That God is a God of justice. And, you know, we really want God to be a God of justice. We all have this innate, instinctual reflex for justice. When we see people being hurt or oppressed, right, we want justice. Our hearts demand it. Now, we might want God to let our personal sins slide, but we definitely want his justice for everybody else, right? I mean, even in, like, the small, ridiculous things, when somebody snubs you maybe at work, I mean, you are ready to call God's fire of judgment down on them. 
If someone like cuts you off on the interstate, you're praying for God's mighty angels to push that person off onto the berm. Gently, right? But, you know, off. Uh, Maybe the Starbucks worker gets your coffee wrong, and we are ready to like slip into King James English. Oh, thou wast holiest God. You know, pour down plagues on the iniquity of the Starbucks worker. It may just be me. I really take my coffee seriously, so point is we all want justice, even in little ridiculous things, right? Our hearts kind of demand justice. How much more for serious injustices that we see throughout the world, and how much more for rebellion against the king of the universe? This is what Paul says in his letter to the Romans. The wrath of God, the punishment or the justice of God, is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Paul's not pulling any punches here, right? See, we want a God of justice, but this is a dilemma for all of us. All of us. Why? Because we are all sinful. We are all rebels. We are all treasonous against God. We have said, I know it should be your way, but I want it my way. I want it my way. And therefore, we are all under God's justice. And this is bad news for us as sinners. But there's good news. There's good news because God is both just and he is merciful. Let's pick back up our passage in Colossians. This is the bad news, right? You were dead because of your sins and because your sinful nature was not yet cut away. And here is the good news. Then God made you alive with Christ for he forgave all our sins. He canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. How can God be both just and merciful? He can be both just and merciful because of the cross. In the cross, God sustains his justness and he sustains his mercy. And this is where we get the good news, the gospel. You see, someone has to pay the debt for sinful rebellion. I cannot pay it. You cannot pay it. It is too immense. It is too big. And so we have a God who says, I will pay it. I will pay it myself. Jesus Christ, God in flesh, willingly goes to the cross, innocent and holy, to take on the debt that each and every one of us owes God. He takes it on himself. The charges against us are nailed to the cross. Paul says it another way, again, in his letter to the Romans. He says, for all, you, me, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood. And how do we receive that mercy? How do we have access to that mercy? Paul tells us here, We receive it by faith, through trust in Christ. The ability for us as Christ followers to forgive other people is rooted in the atonement, the fact that Christ has taken on our penalty of our sin. Because in the cross, God is both just and merciful. It may be that some of you have never put your faith in Christ. You've never trusted Christ. You've never experienced kind of the sweetness and beauty of God's mercy poured out for you. And so I want to give us the chance. I want to take a moment right now. Often we do this at the end of service, but I want to take a moment right now as we're lingering on this idea to give you an opportunity If you feel like the Holy Spirit is stirring your heart and you want to put your faith and trust in Christ, I want to give you an opportunity to do that right now. And so if everybody here in the auditorium, if we could all bow our heads and close our eyes, we want to give some space to people as the Holy Spirit might be moving on their hearts, might be calling out to them to put their faith in Christ Jesus. You see, if we understand, we are often reluctant to forgive people who hurt us. But God is not like that. The Bible tells us that God is quick to mercy and eager to forgive and that he's made a way in Christ if you trust him. 
So with everybody's eyes closed and their heads bowed, I'm not going to embarrass anyone. I'm not going to call anyone out. I'm not going to put a spotlight on you. I'm not going to call you down here to the front. But I would like to know who I'm praying with and for. And so if that's you, if you want to put your faith and trust in Christ this morning, if you can raise your hand. Again, I'm not going to embarrass you, but if you want to raise your hand, I want to know who I'm standing with and praying for. Okay, you can put those hands down. And I want you to silently, where you're at, you can join me in this prayer. Pray this with me. Father, thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for his blood. And thank you for the cross. I put my trust in you now. Adopt me as your son. Adopt me as your daughter. Help me to follow you. Help me to experience your love. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Transform me even now. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Why don't we congratulate those people? Um, you know, we, uh, you know, we want to stand with you here at Vineyard, and again, we're not going to hassle you or stalk you, uh, but if you want to tell us about that, we would love to know. And so you can actually use your Connect card, which is in your program. You can let us know about that decision today. And when you leave the auditorium, there's just a clear box between the two auditorium doors. You can slip that right in there, and we want to stand with you and pray with you in that decision. Because God is going to begin to do something new and transformational in your life. It is the beginning of a beautiful, beautiful thing. We know from the cross that God is both just and merciful. And this is key to understanding forgiveness. This is key to understanding how we as Christians can forgive. Because what the cross tells us is that we cannot seek personal vengeance. That justice is not ours, it is God's. Again, Paul is very helpful in his letter to the Romans. He makes it very clear. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but have room for God's wrath, God's justice. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. The reason that we as followers of Christ do not seek revenge against the people who hurt us. One reason is because we know we serve a God who will make all things right eventually. And we can leave that into his hands. Maybe not in our lifetime, but ultimate justice will be served. And so we can trust Christ. We can say, Lord, I'm going to give you this injustice. I'm not going to seek personal vengeance. I'm not going to seek revenge. I'm going to leave it for you to take care of. But you know, as followers of Christ, we can go way beyond just saying, I will not seek revenge. Why? Because God's not only just, God is merciful. And he's poured his mercy out on us if we have put our faith in him. Look at what Jesus tells us in the Gospel of Luke. Be merciful. Why? Because your father is merciful and you've experienced his mercy. The fact that we have a just God and a merciful God lays the foundation for Christ followers to have the ability to forgive other people. Now, those of us who are Christ followers know that despite the fact that we have experienced the forgiveness of Christ, it is not always easy to forgive other people. And Paul knows this. And that's why he goes on in his letter to the Colossians to talk to them about how they forgive each other. So that's where we're going to pick it back up laying it on the foundation that all forgiveness comes because of atonement that we experience in Christ. But here is the next part that we're picking this up in chapter 3 of Colossians, reading from the English Standard Version. He says, Put on then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. Old English would say forbearance. Bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so also you must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Whew, that's a mouthful. 
But let's spend a little bit of time in this passage. I think there's lots of points about forgiveness that we can pull out of this passage. And the first is this. The first is this. Forgiveness flows out of our identity in Christ. Forgiveness flows out of our identity in Christ. Look at what Paul says in our passage. Put on then as what? God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. You see, Paul knows that our ability to forgive others flows out of our identity in Christ. He reminds the Colossians, he reminds us, hey, you are God's chosen ones. You are holy in Christ. You are God's beloved. When we remember who we are in Christ, when our identity is rooted in who God says we are, we are in a much better place to forgive other people. Because when someone makes you feel small, you can remember I'm loved by God, and he is really, really big. When someone makes you feel unwanted or as an outcast, you can think, I am chosen by the creator of the universe. When we know who we are in Christ, when we remember what God says about us as his sons and daughters, not what other people say about us, then we can more easily forgive others. Forgiveness flows out of our identity in Christ. A second point that we can get from this passage is this. Forgiveness is often unnecessary when we put on the character of Christ. Forgiveness is often unnecessary when we put on the character of Christ. What does Paul tell us in our passage? He says, put on then compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And how does he wrap it up at the end? And above all else, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Paul knows that when people look more like Jesus, when you look more like Jesus, when I look more like Jesus, there's often not even a need for forgiveness. Why? Well, because when people are compassionate, when they're kind, when they're humble, they don't take themselves too seriously, when we approach each other with meekness, sometimes translated gentleness, when we're patient with each other, when we bear with each other, even when we annoy each other, we bear with each other. When you meet a person like that, that person is so hard to offend. Are they not a kind, meek, gentle, humble person? In contrast, if you are the type of person who comes home each night with a really long list of all the people that you need to forgive from that day, right? You know, oh, there was the lady at the coffee shop. I, I have a problem with coffee shops, apparently. Um, so there's a lady at the coffee shop. There's, there's Jenna from work. I, I know she doesn't like me. There's Stu from work. I know he's always talking about me behind my back. There's my boss. She never appreciates me. There's my spouse. Don't even get me started, right? There's my sister. She didn't call me on my birthday. Oh, God, help me to forgive all these wretched sinners, these wretched, wretched sinners. I mean, if, that, if that's your night every night, you may think that you have a forgiveness problem. I'm not sure you have a forgiveness problem, but you may have a character problem. You may have a character problem. You know, I'll give you an example from my own life. So for many, many years, the first several years of my marriage, an embarrassingly long time, in fact, my wife, Jen, would say something to me or she'd do something and it would annoy me. It would upset me. And so I would retreat into myself. I would get sullen. I would get silent. You know, I'd think, well, if that's what she thinks, I'm not even going to talk to her at all. Or if, well, if she feels that way, then I'm going to punish her by, you know, emotionally shutting down. And this could go on for days, right? You know, some men in here know what I'm talking about, right? Uh, and usually it would end in an argument or tears. And by that time, I don't even remember what I was upset about. Now, I may have thought I had a forgiveness problem. Oh, Lord, help me forgive my wife. You know, I just, I, you know, but I didn't have a forgiveness problem, right? I had a compassion problem. I had a humility problem. I had a meekness problem. I had lots of problems. Still have lots of problems. Praise God, I'm still growing, right? And we're all learning. But, but you know, when we put on the character of Christ, I think we will find often forgiveness is it's unnecessary, I love how Pastor Andy put it last week in his sermon. 
And I think in some ways what Pastor Andy said kind of sums up this point. He says this, as Christians, let us have thick skin and tender hearts. Let us have thick skin and tender hearts. Those are the kind of people that we want to be. We want to be like Jesus. Now, there are legitimate complaints and there are legitimate wrongs. So what do we do if there are legitimate complaints, legitimate wrongs? Well, you can see on your outline and up here, we forgive because Christ forgave us. We forgive because Christ forgave us. Right in the middle of our passage, we see that Paul talks about this. It's, if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. God takes forgiveness very, very seriously. Why? Well, because he knows that bitterness and unforgiveness choke the life out of us. It chokes the life out of us. And also because forgiveness, the ability to forgive, is the sign of a forgiven heart. God knows that our ability to forgive is a sign that he's worked in our own hearts. You may be saying, is forgiveness that big of a deal? Let me tell you, yes. Jesus speaks about forgiveness all the time. And in your program, I've listed a number of passages from the Gospels where Jesus speaks specifically to the importance of forgiveness. But to give you just a taste of those, I'm just going to come to one passage here in Matthew. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Forgiveness is a big deal because God knows our ability to forgive others is a sign that he has forgiven us. And we have to be careful because if we haven't and we can't forgive other people, it may be a sign that we are not forgiven ourselves. Now, does that mean that there's nothing ever really to deal with. There's no complaint. Do we just forgive and, and let it go, right? Sometimes we say forgive and forget. And yes, there are instances that's exactly what we should do. You just forgive and you forget. You move on with your life. But not always, because the Bible gives us clear instructions on how to, to use Paul's language, to bring a complaint, okay? There are two key passages I want to look at together look at together with you. There's probably more passages in the Bible that deal with about how do we bring a complaint in a biblical, Christ-honoring way, but I just want to focus on these two, okay? How do we bring a complaint in a Christ-honoring way? The first is we want to look at Matthew 18, and here I'm giving it to you from the message, the paraphrase, the message by Peterson. He says this, if a fellow believer hurts you, go and tell him. Work it out between the two of you. If he listens, you have made a friend. That is where we start. You go first to the person who has wronged you, and you lovingly talk about it. And as believers, if we are coming together in compassion and meekness and humility and patience, resolution will most often happen right there between those two people. Now, if resolution cannot happen between those two people, what are we instructed to do? If he won't listen, take one or two others along so that the presence of witnesses will keep things honest and try again. We get some godly, wise people. We go to them, not to gang up on this other person, but so that we keep things honest, including ourselves. Because there will be times... If you go to your friends and you explain the situation, your friends may tell you, you are making a mountain out of a molehill and you need to let it go. And you listen to those godly friends. You keep things honest. There may even be times where you go to godly wise friends, you explain the situation and they actually tell you, I don't think you're the one who was wronged. I think you are the one who wronged. And then you have to own up to your stuff as well. We keep things honest by inviting godly, wise counsel from other believers. Now, if the person has truly wronged you, 
and reconciliation needs to take place, and your wise and godly friends have confirmed that, yes, and you go and there's still no resolution, then Matthew 18 says to bring it to church leadership. If he still won't listen, tell the church. If he won't listen to the church, you'll have to start over from scratch, confront him with the need for repentance, and offer again God's forgiving love. We bring it to church leadership. Perhaps it's your small group leader. They can help you with resolution. Perhaps it's your team leader of whatever ministry that you might serve on here at church. Bring it to your team leader or to a staff member and ultimately maybe to one of our pastoral staff. We don't gossip. We don't backbite. We definitely don't drag this out onto social media, you know, you know, John Doe wronged me at church. Um, you know, I took some godly friends. John is the worst. I'm now bringing this to, uh, to church leadership via social media. Hashtag Matthew 18. Hashtag biblical reconciliation. Hashtag blessed, right? You know, um, this is not how we do biblical reconciliation. There are legitimate wrongs. There are legitimate complaints And the Bible has given us instructions on how to do that in a biblical, Christ-honoring way. That's the first passage. Now, there's a second passage I want to look at together as well. And it comes from Romans 13, 1 and 4. It says, Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities. They are God's servant, agents of wrath, agents of God's justice, to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Now you might say this is a weird passage to bring into a forgiveness sermon. So let me explain what is going on here in this passage. First of all, this passage reiterates that personal vengeance is never ours. We are never as Christians to seek personal revenge. However, the Bible tells us here in Romans that God has established governing authorities and he has given them the authority to distribute wrath, to distribute justice on his behalf. And that is why it is entirely appropriate for us as Christians to not only forgive, but also seek justice through the justice system. This passage gives us the license to do that. If someone embezzles your elderly parents' retirement fund, okay, you can forgive that person and bring them into a court of law, right? A child molester can be forgiven, but also face the consequences of that hideous crime. A drunk driver who injures someone, right? They can be forgiven, but also serve community service and required rehab. And the list could go on and on. And it's a passage like this that tells us it is entirely appropriate for we as Christians to serve in the military or on a jury or on law enforcement or as lawyers or judges or just as ordinary citizens seeking justice through the democratic process. All of that is allowed. That doesn't go against forgiveness. You know, you can sit on a jury and still convict somebody for a a crime. That's not unforgiveness. The Bible tells us this. It's not personal vengeance. We never seek personal vengeance. But you can seek forgiveness and use the justice system at the same time. The Bible provides us with biblical pathways in which to seek reconciliation and justice, not personal revenge. But all the while, we are still commanded to forgive because Christ forgave us. And forgiveness is hard. Forgiveness is hard. I can guess that everybody in this room has a situation where forgiveness, maybe even years afterwards, just the pain is still there. The hurt is still there. The fear is still there. The powerlessness is still there. Now, you may ask yourself, if I'm still feeling that, does that mean I haven't actually forgiven that person? Perhaps. And you need to search your own heart, and you need to bring that to God. But I also think, I also think that the pain of some things can linger even after you have forgiven them. You know, we can think about this by way of an analogy, right? We can be physically injured by someone, forgive them, 
and still feel the lingering effects of that physical injury, can we not? Well, we can also feel the lingering effects and pain emotionally, psychologically, even spiritually. Even after we have forgiven someone, we can still feel that pain. So what do we do with a physical injury? Well, we go to a physical therapist, right? We get stretches, we, we lift weights, we do strength training, and that can also be true in this analogy of our lingering non-physical pain. About two years ago, uh, I was having a lot of trouble in my left foot every time I went running. I love to run, and uh, just having so much pain in my left foot. So I, um, I went to a physical therapist, and I kind of explained the situation. My foot was hurting, and the physical therapist immediately gave me back stretches. And I was like, mm, I'm pretty sure I clearly said the pain was in my foot, not in my back. And then she gave me some leg stretches, and I was like, well, that's closer to my foot, but still not my foot. But you know, I trusted the doctor. I trusted the doctor. I did my back stretches and strength training. I did my leg stretches and, and strength training. And with time, the pain in my foot subsided. You know, the doctor explained to me that the place of pain is not always the actual problem, right? Sometimes, she said, it's further upstream were the words that she used. And for some of you, that may be exactly what is happening. You have forgiven that situation. You have forgiven that person. But you still have a lot of pain in that particular area. But perhaps the problem might not be the pain itself. It might actually be a little bit upstream for you. So what do I mean by this? Well, let's look back at our passage to discuss this, right? For some of you, it's not the area of pain that's the problem. It's identity that might be the problem. That you need to be reminded on a regular basis, that you are a chosen one by God, that you are holy in Christ, that you're beloved by God, and maybe that's what you need to be reminded of. That's what you need to be focused on. For some of you, maybe it's not identity. Maybe it's character. And maybe you need to be strengthening the virtues of Christ in your life, right? Things like compassionate hearts and kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. And as those virtues and character strengthen then it allows that area of hurt and pain to heal more quickly. Now, you understand, I, I went to physical therapy for several months, and, and eventually my, my doctor did introduce stretches and strength training in my foot itself. And for some of you, the area of pain is indeed the source. That is indeed the source. And for you, we need to strengthen that area of forgiveness and we need to be reminded that we can forgive because Christ forgave us. And as we reflect and we dwell on the great forgiveness of Christ, it may allow us to begin to heal in that area where we still have a lot of pain surrounding that incident. Now for this analogy to work, you may be asking, well, are there activities or stretches or strength training for my lingering pain? from this hurt, this spiritual hurt? And the answer is yes. And Paul gives them to us right here in this very passage. And so I want to return to our passage and look at some ways, some activities to help the healing process of pain from our past. Even, okay, you've said, I've forgiven this person. I've forgiven the situation. How do I strengthen? How do I get rid of that pain and that hurt well, Paul prescribes us some stretches, some strength training, okay? And so we're going to look at our passage. Very quickly, we're going to look at our passage, and we're going to see what Paul prescribes us. Dr. Paul is giving us this. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. Now, there are lots of ways to let the peace of Christ reign and rule in our hearts. But the primary way, I would say, that the Scriptures tell us to do that is through prayer, it's through prayer. Are you strengthening your prayer muscles? Are you doing your flex training in prayer? Are you bringing to God on a regular basis those feelings of hurt, those feelings of anxiety, those desires for revenge? Are you bringing that to God in prayer? Are you strengthening that area of your life? Paul goes on. He says this, and be thankful. Got to love it. Short, pithy, and be thankful. Are we engaging in thankfulness? 
Now, thankfulness is an attitude, but it is an attitude that we can produce by activity. Are you making it a regular daily habit to thank God, to list off the things that you are thankful for? Now, you can do this easily, you know, uh, five minutes in the car. I'm thankful for this, Lord. Thankful for this, thankful for this, thankful for this. And even on your darkest day, you can still thank God for his love shed and given to us on the cross through Christ Jesus. There's always something to be thankful for as a follower of Christ. Are we routinely engaging in thankfulness and strengthening that spiritual life, which will hopefully, with God's help and God's grace, begin to heal us? All right. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Are you engaging with God's word? Are you reading it? Are you listening to it? It's in God's word where we hear his promises to us. It's in God's word where he tells us his plans that he has for us. It's in God's word where we hear who we are in Christ. And if we have an identity problem, we need to be going into God's word so that we can be reminded continually, this is who I am. This is who I am in Christ. This is who I am in Christ. Paul, what else does he prescribe us? Dr. Paul, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. Now, we can come here and meet together on the weekend, and that's a good and a wonderful thing. But this passage specifically says teaching and admonishing one another. And we as the body of believers don't do that very much on a weekend service. But there is a place we do it, and I think you know what I'm going to say. We do it in small groups. We do it when we come together in smaller groups of Christian believers, because that's where we can really talk things out. Hey, I'm dealing with this. I'm dealing with unforgiveness. I've got a lot of pain in this area, and people can pray for you, and not only in that moment, but throughout the week. How many of us have people praying for us on a regular basis? I'm telling you, you can get that in a small group, and we need that. We need to come together. We need to strengthen that muscle Now listen, if you are really dealing with unforgiveness, I would encourage you, we have small groups called Freedom Groups. And we have a new semester starting in spring. Now you can join a small group right now, but the Freedom Groups, really it's best to start at the beginning. So if you really struggle with unforgiveness, a Freedom Group might be great for you. And when we launch at the end of January, beginning of February, I would really think about joining a Freedom Group. What else does Paul prescribe? Singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Are we saturating? Are we saturating our lives with worship? Are we saturating our lives with worship? We can come here and worship together, and God does something special and unique when we're all together and singing hymns and spiritual songs together. But you can worship anywhere, right? You can crank it in the car to and from work. You can sing in the shower, you know? You can just belt it out. God will love it, and you can worship in the shower. Now, what else does Paul say? in his list of prescription here. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. This passage talks about a lot, but one thing it certainly speaks to is that we do things in Jesus' name, words or deeds for other people. And let me tell you that service is a wonderful way to help the pain of past hurts and to help you with unforgiveness if you're struggling with it. Because there's nothing that takes our eyes off ourselves as putting our eyes on the needs of other people. And we take growth track seriously here, and we're always pushing growth track. Growth track four right after this service, growth track one next week. Because not only do we want you to get to know who we are at the vineyard, but more than that, we want you to get to know who you are. How has God made you? How has he created you? your unique gifts and talents and personality that you can use to serve other people. Listen, I know sometimes we throw around this idea that, right, uh, you know, that healing just takes time, right? That, um, that healing just takes time. That, uh, and, and that's true, but you know what? Um, we also know that things that are just left to heal on their own can sometimes fester, you know? They can fester, And so we want to make sure that we are actively doing something to heal the wounds that we've experienced, the unforgiveness that we might have in our hearts. And Paul gives us the stretches and the strength training that we need as Christians to do that. I will end here. While I was at my physical therapy, there was another fellow there. He had back problems, and uh, he was in the 
therapy medical kind of bed next to mine. And so I could hear his whole conversation with the doctor. And he had been going to physical therapy, I don't know, for about, um, I don't know, a couple months. And he still was having a lot of back pain. And so the, the doctor just asked him, like, are you doing the exercises and the strength training that I gave you? And he admitted, no, I'm not doing it. And then he confessed, you know, I'm really just kind of dealing with the pain, uh, with pain meds, just a lot of pain meds every day. You know, I think that's how we can be sometimes. You know, we, we don't want the pain anymore. We don't want the hurt. We don't want the anger. But we really want a quick fix. We don't want to engage in the activities that God knows will help us heal. And so like this man, we find other ways to deal with the pain. You know, perhaps it's just distracting ourselves with social media or entertainment just so we don't have to remember it. Maybe it's more serious than that. Maybe it's it's drinking too much alcohol or using narcotics to, to numb the pain. Perhaps it's fits of rage. Maybe it's moving from one relationship to another because we're too afraid to let anybody get close to us anymore. Or maybe it's just really pushing it down deep inside where it eats slowly at us in depression and anxiety. I know God wants more for you than that. I know God wants more for you than that. And I know it because he demonstrated it on the cross. He demonstrated it on the cross. He demonstrated his love and his mercy for us on the cross. And that is where we find mercy through faith. And that is where we find the ability to forgive other people. It is in the cross. Thank you so much. It's been a wonderful time with you this morning. And I want to go ahead and pray for us, and then we're going to do some transition. But I want to pray that the Lord would begin to work in our hearts and just continue to work in us through this week. Would you pray with me? Father God, I thank you for your mercy. I thank you for your kindness to us. I thank you for the blood of Jesus, and I thank you for the cross. I thank you that you are not only just, but you are also merciful. And because you are both just and merciful, you have empowered us to forgive other people. And Lord, if someone, a person, a situation came to mind while I was talking today, I would just ask, Lord, that you would continue to do a powerful, healing, wonderful, gracious work in the lives of each and every person in this room to help each and every one of us to heal, to get stronger in you, and to be able to forgive others. In Jesus' precious and holy name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, wonderful. So we're going to go ahead and do some transitions. Again, I want to remind you, Grow Track Step 4, banner in the hallway right after this service. And so you can check that out if you want. Also really want to remind you that we always have prayer teams right up here after service. And if you want someone to pray for you, it can be about unforgiveness. It could be about anything that came to mind during the service. But any range of problems, physical healing, struggles of any kind, it is good to get prayer. It is good to get prayer. And if you want to join with us in the church and help us to do all that we're doing, please feel free to give and worship God uh, that way. And you can look on the screen. It gives you a variety of ways you can do that. You can text 45777 VCC in the amount. You can go to vineyardchurch.com or you can go to the info desk to set up Quick Give. And if you're interested in what Quick Give is, they can explain that at the info desk. So why don't we go ahead and stand together? I'm going to pray us into one final worship song. And so, Father, we thank you. We glorify you. We praise you. We lift up your holy name. We thank you. And in Jesus' name, we pray. Amen.